Hi, I'm Shannon, one of the librarians here at Naperville Public Library, and today we are going to talk about the real people behind your favorite foods. So maybe you've seen their names on a package at the supermarket or on a restaurant storefront. You might have even seen a few of their faces in commercials or ads. But who are the real people behind your favorite foods? Let's find out. So let's start with breakfast. Will Keith Kellogg was a food manufacturer, best known for founding the Kellogg Company, a name still synonymous with cereal. He started out selling brooms, but moved to Battle Creek, Michigan to help his brother John Harvey Kellogg run the Battle Creek Sanitarium, based on health principles espoused by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. While attempting to make granola in the 1890s, they accidentally made a cereal composed of flaked wheat berry, and when they tried it again with corn, cornflakes were created. Will wanted to keep this process a secret, but John would let any visitor to the sanitarium observe the making of the cereal. C.W. Post, a guest, used this process to create his own cereal and later his own companies, Post Cereals and then General Foods. W.K. Kellogg later founded a ranch for breeding Arabian horses. He was also a major philanthropist, founding the W.K. Kellogg Child Welfare Foundation, now the Kellogg Foundation. In 1934, with $66 million in Kellogg stocks and investments worth over a billion today. Learn more about the Kellogg brothers in The Kellogg's, The Battling Brothers of Battle Creek by Howard Markell. Jerome M. Smucker was a Mennonite farmer who started his business by selling cider in 1897. He then moved on to selling apple butter out of the back of a horse-drawn wagon, and later the better-known jams and jellies. Smucker's listed its ingredients many years before the law required it. The company was incorporated in 1921. The business is still family-owned and still headquartered in its founder's hometown of Orville, Ohio. An interesting evolution of the name. The family was of Swiss descent and it was originally spelled Schmucker. It was later spelled Smoker for about two generations until family members grew uncomfortable with the implication of tobacco usage and adopted the current spelling of Smucker. Do you want to be the next Jerome Smucker? Check out the book Canning Essentials, jam-packed with essential tools, techniques, and recipes for fruits, veggies, jams, pickles, salsas, and more. In 1899, James Drummond Dole was a Harvard graduate who moved to Honolulu, Hawaii, which was then governed by his cousin Sanford B. Dole. On his 64-acre homestead on Oahu, he experimented with various crops before deciding to grow pineapples. The farm and business grew, with a cannery opening in 1907 and a national ad campaign raising demand, such as this ad from 1910 that you can see on the right. In 1913, an invention that could peel and core 35 pineapples every minute improved production. And Sanford Dole had asked his enterprising cousin to avoid using the family name on products, but it had become well known in Hawaii. The first product actually bearing the name was Dole Pineapple Juice. James Dole retired in 1948 and he passed away in 1958, but his name is still synonymous with pineapple. Born in Sussex, England, Maria Ann, Granny Smith, and her husband and family settled in Australia in 1838. Her husband ultimately found employment in the fruit-growing district of Kissing Point and bought 24 acres from a local orchard. In 1868, Smith discovered a green apple plant growing on the land where she had tossed the remains from some French crab apples from Tasmania. The green apples that grew from the seedlings are now famous for their tart taste and are good for baking. Smith planted a few of these seedling trees, and Edward Gallard, a local orchardist, planted a number of them. Smith died in 1870. The apple was not a commercial variety in her lifetime, but in the next two decades, Granny Smith's seedlings began to win prizes. In 1895, they were planted on a large scale at the government experimental station at Bathurst, and the variety was included in the Department of Agriculture's list of fruits suitable for export, thus beginning its commercial life. If you want to cook with apples, check out the books Apple, Recipes from the Orchard, The Apple Lover's Cookbook, 
and apples to cider, how to make cider at home. Jimmy Dean wasn't originally famous for sausage. He was a country musician known for songs such as Big Bad John and had his own television show. But he and his brother created a meat processing company in their hometown of Plainview, Texas, in case the fickle entertainment industry stopped providing. Jimmy's motto was, sausage is a great deal like life. You get out of it what you put into it. In 1984, Jimmy Dean sold the company to Sarah Lee Foods, but stayed on as the spokesman until 2003, and he died in 2010. So let's make a meal. Clarence Birdseye was a naturalist and inventor who excelled at science. He worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture after financial issues forced him to leave college. While on a field assignment in Labrador in the Dominion of Newfoundland, now Canada, between 1912 and 1915, he became interested in freezing food for preservation. The Inuit taught him to ice fish, and he learned that the fish would freeze almost instantly when exposed to air that was 30 degrees below zero, and tasted fresh when thawed, not mushy. This led to experiments in freezing food fast to avoid large ice crystals, followed by the creation of his own company to make quick frozen fish fillets, but it went bankrupt due to lack of consumer demand. He developed a new invention, the double belt freezer, which could quickly freeze packaged fish and later meat, poultry, vegetables, and fruits. Birdseye died in 1956. Several books have been written about Birdseye by Mark Kurlansky. George Hormel opened a pork processing plant in Austin, Minnesota in 1891 after having worked at a meat packing house in Chicago from the age of 12. He remained head of the company until 1929 when it was passed on to his son Jay. The Hormel Foods Corporation developed the world's first canned ham, then chili, then Spam in 1937. You can visit the Spam Museum in Austin, Minnesota. If you're a real Spam fan, check out this cookbook, The Ultimate Spam Cookbook, 100 plus quick and delicious recipes from traditional to gourmet. In 1873, Oscar Meyer immigrated to Detroit from Bavaria and became a butcher's apprentice. Not long after that, he moved to Chicago. In 1883, the first Oscar Meyer hot dog shop opened with opening day sales totaling $59 at a time when pork cuts cost 8 to 12 cents a pound. The popularity of the shop grew and the store expanded, sponsoring local events such as the White City World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. In 1906, Oscar Mayer Company was one of the first companies to join the new federal meat inspection program. The well-known Wienermobile first appeared in 1936, and the Oscar Mayer Wiener song was written in 1962. Oscar Mayer died in 1955 and is buried in Chicago's Rose Hill Cemetery. Speaking of hot dogs, Nathan Handworker was a restaurant worker who opened a hot dog stand at Coney Island in 1916 at the urging of actors Jimmy Durante and Eddie Cantor, both of whom were singing waiters at his former place of employment. His hot dog stand sold frankfurters for five cents a piece, half of what a competitor was charging. Handworker named his hot dog stand Nathan's Hot Dogs in 1921 after a Sophie Tucker song popularized his name. Nathan Handworker's son, Murray, expanded the stand into the chain Nathan's Famous starting in 1959. A location still stands on the original site at Surf and Stillwell Avenues in Brooklyn at Coney Island, and Nathan Handworker died in 1974. How about some toppings to go on those hot dogs? You can thank Henry John Hines for so much variety. Hines started out with a small horseradish business, which failed, but his second company, founded with a brother and cousin, produced Heinz tomato ketchup as one of their early products, and it was a hit. The company's slogan, 57 Varieties, was introduced by Heinz in 1896, although by then, the company was selling over 60 different products. Heinz said he chose five because it was his lucky number, and the number seven was his wife's lucky number. Heinz products included relish, pickles, soups, sauces, vinegars, olives, and mustard. And H.J. Hines died in 1919. 
Perhaps mayonnaise is your condiment of choice. We can look to Richard Hellman, who immigrated from Germany in 1903 and married into a family that ran a delicatessen in New York City. Two years later, he opened his own delicatessen, where he dished out small servings of his first ready-made mayonnaise for customers. Its popularity led him to sell it in large quantities and improve the recipe to increase the shelf life. In September 1913, he began to sell it under the name Hellman's Blue Ribbon Mayonnaise. The company was incorporated as Richard Hellman Inc. three years later, and after briefly trying out some other products, Hellman set his sights solely on mayonnaise. In 1920, a New York newspaper asked three chefs to test commercial salad dressings, and they voted Hellman's mayonnaise as the best, citing that it had more oil, 85%, than any of the others they tested. This taste-off helped to increase Hellman's sales. Hellman merged his company with Best Foods in 1927 and retired, but continued to serve as a board member, and he died in 1971. Annie Withy and Andrew Martin decided to make delicious healthy food. They had previously founded Smart Food Popcorn, but this went in a different direction. In 1989, the new company, Annie's Homegrown, started out by selling natural macaroni and cheese in New England. In the early days, a customer calling the phone number on an Annie's Homegrown package would likely reach Annie herself. In 1999, John Foraker an owner of Homegrown Natural Foods and his company invested $2 million in Annie's company. Withy was recast as Annie's inspirational president, and the company began distributing its products to national chains. General Mills bought Annie's in 2014 for $820 million. The line now includes shells and white cheddar, pasta shaped like peace signs, organic products, gluten-free products, vegan products, in addition to healthy snacks, cereal, baked goods, and condiments. So let's look at snacks and desserts now. If you're of a certain age, you may associate this face with popcorn, since for a long time Orville Redenbacher appeared in his own commercials. This farm boy from Valparaiso, Indiana, began to grow and sell popcorn to fund his college education, and he ultimately got a Bachelor of Science from Purdue. In 1965, Redenbacher and his business partner discovered their perfect hybrid of popcorn after years of experimenting. In addition to being light and fluffy, it has a ratio of 44 to 1 popped to unpopped kernels, and Orville Redenbacher died in 1995. Wynn Schuler was an educator and football coach who took over his family's restaurant, the Schuler Inn in Marshall, Michigan, in 1934 and became known as the Consummate Host. There were eventually nine Wynn Schuler's restaurants in Michigan and Indiana. Since waits could be long at the popular restaurants, Schuler came up with the idea of offering waiting guests a cheese spread, known as bar cheese, to snack on until they got a table. Winchuler's cheese spread is now made for the commercial market by Vlasic Foods. Schuler received the Gold Plate Award in 1971 from the International Food Service Manufacturers Association, the highest distinction in the industry, as well as numerous other awards in the hospitality field. The chain of restaurants has since narrowed back to the original location in Marshall. Wynn Schuler died in 1993. Maybe you aren't familiar with the name Wally Amos, but you might know him better as Famous Amos, the maker of chocolate chip cookies. Wally Amos developed his chocolate chip cookie recipe based on that of his aunt, Della Bryant. Amos worked for the William Morris Agency, first as a mailroom clerk, but then moving up to become their first African-American talent agent. He headed the agency's rock and roll department and was responsible for signing the harmonious duo Simon and Garfunkel. Amos drew in clients by sending them his cookies. He represented musicians including Marvin Gaye, Sam Cooke, and Diana Ross. Amos started the famous Amos business in 1975 with a loan from Marvin Gaye and Helen Reddy, and eventually his cookies appeared on grocery store shelves. He also became a motivational speaker and published 10 books, including The Cookie Never Crumbles and The Famous Amos Story, The Face That Launched a Thousand Chips. Another name known for cookies is Mrs. Fields. 
Debbie Fields and her husband, Randy, opened their first bakery selling homestyle cookies in Palo Alto, California in 1977. Popularity grew and Mrs. Fields' shops soon appeared in malls and airports. In 2007, for its 30th anniversary, Mrs. Fields had a campaign involving a national search for a new cookie. 700 plus recipes were entered, but Carrie Lawrence's recipe for oatmeal peanut butter scotchies was chosen as Mrs. Fields' 30th anniversary cookie. By the way, if you think you have the Mrs. Fields' secret recipe for chocolate chip cookies thanks to a chain letter from the 80s, sorry, it's fake. The Mrs. Fields company states that their recipe has never been sold and the recipe is a trade secret. If you ask someone to name the most famous American chocolate brand, they're probably going to say Hershey's. This company was started by Milton Hershey, who apprenticed at age 14 to learn the trade of candy making. In 1876, he started his first confectionery business in Philadelphia. He pioneered the manufacture of caramels using fresh milk and sold them in bulk through his company, the Lancaster Caramel Company. But after the White City World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893, he became interested in chocolate and sold the Caramel Company for $1 million to start his chocolate company. Hershey developed his milk chocolate over the next few years, and the Hershey Bar was produced in 1900, with Hershey's Kisses following in 1907, and the Hershey Bar with Almonds coming in 1908. He was also a philanthropist, developing the Hershey Industrial School and the Milton Hershey School Trust Fund and supplying chocolate bars to the armed forces during World War II. Hershey and his wife avoided an ill-fated trip on the Titanic. They canceled their booking at the last minute, and he lived until 1945. Learn more about Milton Hershey in the book Hershey, Milton S. Hershey's Extraordinary Life of Wealth, Empire, and Utopian Dreams by Michael D'Antonio. And now a word about changing with the times. So even when based on real people, some companies have changed with the times for important reasons. Uncle Ben's rice was a parboiled rice product first introduced in 1943 by Converted Rice Inc., now owned by Mars Inc. According to the company, their namesake figurehead had a dual origin. The name came from a farmer in Texas known for the high quality of his rice, and the logo that appeared on the box for decades was based on Frank Brown, who was a maitre d' hotel in Chicago. It was pointed out by the public that the brand name Uncle Ben's had racist origins, since in the South, African-American men would be addressed as uncle rather than mister as a way to treat them less equally. In 2007, the company ran a new advertising campaign in which Ben was shown in a posh office as a chairman of the board type figure. And flash forward to 2020 in a world full of protests over racial injustice, and the public said, this still isn't enough. And the company listened. In September 2020, Uncle Ben's became Ben's original and did away with the picture of Ben on the box. And thank you for watching. Hope you've learned something about the favorite food figures that uh, reside in your food figures that uh, reside in your pantry. Hope we'll see you again soon at the library and bye bye for now.